Okay, good morning, Boker Tov. I want to thank uh, Esli Lupin for sponsoring this morning's Amunashir in honor of her sister in law's Yeratzeit. Liba Gabriela Bashmuel, Mayor Neshama, have an Aliyah. Amen. May her family find uh, comfort through her memory. Just uh, before we begin, the source that we're going to delve into today, I uh, just posted this on our Amuna group, but I'll share with you anyway because I think it's really transformative. It changed the way I appreciate Tanis Esther that uh, today is unlike every other fast day. All other fast days, both major and minor, have a component that they are commemorating a calamity, a tragedy of the past. Mostly tied around the Churban. Last night, we concluded our 20th Century Moments That Mattered series with a talk on Yom HaShoah, the founding of Yom HaShoah. Part of the opposition, Ravel Vosalovechik and his nephew, the Rav, and many others, to the establishment of Yom HaShoah was that we, um, we don't add new days, new memorial days, new fast days, but rather they're all subsumed under Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av incorporates all of Jewish people's tragedy throughout the uh, millennia, throughout the generations. So all of our other fast days stem from Churban. They have to do with the breach of the walls, they have to do with the beginning of the destruction. Each commemorates a different stage and ultimately what was the Churban, the destruction of our temples, and the withdrawal of the divine countenance, the withdrawal of the Shechina, from our midst. So, um, so that's true for all the others. And they, they, they mark a calamity, a tragedy of the past. And the way we mark it, the Rambam writes, the Rambam calls it Bnei Hatzaros. Why are we fasting? To mark a tragedy. And what's the goal? La orer tshuva, to arouse, to inspire within us a sense of self-reflection, introspection, personal growth. Tshuva, we should repent. So fast days are usually sad, they're somber. We're not giddy, we're not happy, we're not joyous, but rather we're very focused. We're focused on what went wrong in our past, and we're focused on how we can correct it in our future. But the Rambam says, when it comes to today, Tanis Esther, it's not about Mibnei HaTzaros, we're not marking a calamity of the past, but rather Mibnei HaTanis. We are simply reenacting and reliving the fast day that Esther and Mordechai established for all the Jewish people. What does that mean? It means Haman understood that our greatest vulnerability, our weakest point was that we were am mefuzar u mefurad bein ha'amim. We were scattered, we were spread out, we were divided, not only geographically, but metaphysically. We were not getting along with one another. We were in factions. The right didn't like the left, the left didn't like the the right. This one told Mordechai the community is too far to the right. The other one told Mordechai the community is going too far to the left. (coughs) Yeah, I say, Mordechai... Even at the end of the Megillah, Mordechai is only Ratzoi Lerov Echav. When Mordechai is up for a contract renewal after saving the entire Jewish people in Shushan, he only gets the majority of the vote. It's not unanimous. Rov Echav. There were those who voted against him. So that's reassuring. So the Jews were Mefuzar. Even Moshe Rabbeinu. So they were Mefuzar or Mefurad Bein Ha'amim. They were scattered not only geographically, but as a state of mind, as a way of being. They weren't getting along. This one's kids didn't play with that one's kids. They were in a different school. This one accused this one. They wear that kind of yarmulke. This one this, this one that. And what was the antidote? What was the response? Lech kinos kol ha-yehudim. Go gather all of the Jewish people. We need a sense of unity. If we're going to defeat Haman, if we're going to defeat the enemies of our day, it's not going to be by being divided and scattered. It's only going to be when we have a sense of unity. So the original fast for Esther was a fast that really was actually an instrument that united the Jewish people, that created a sense of community, a shared destiny, that what they were facing was bigger and more important than that which, they, that which divided them. So the Ramam says, today is Zecher Latanis. We're commemorating that display of unity, that coming together with a shared story and a shared destiny. So the Ravid writes, today's not a sad day. Unlike other fast days, which are somber and sad and introspection and reflection, today's a happy day. We're not fasting out of sadness. We're fasting to once again experience the notion of uniting together, of being part of a community, and essentially the prerequisite to tonight and tomorrow, before you can make a l'chaim and dress up and attend a chagiga and have fun, before you delve into the Purim hot dogs, before you enjoy the joy of Purim, the prerequisite is first coming together as a community. So today is also part of, it's the beginning of the holiday, it also has a component of simcha, the Rush explains that's why normally we don't fast before a holiday. You omit tachana and you can't give a eulogy. There's rules. The day before a holiday is already a quasi-holiday. How can we fast today? It's an exception to the rule. Because it's not really a fast day in the classic sense of a sad fast day, today is a day of, of joy. So I wish you 
I always, when people say I have an easy fast, it always bothers me because the goal of the fast is not to be easy. The goal of the fast, particularly Yom Kippur, the Inisim Es Nafsho the goal of Yom Kippur is to feel discomfort, to feel uncomfortable. And discomfort is usually what stimulates growth and change. So it always bothers me when people say I have an easy fast. But today I say have a happy fast. It's a happy fast. To the degree that you can, have a happy fast. So I want to uh, take a break from our normal study. Instead of uh, our normal study on Dveikus, I want to interrupt our normally scheduled program for a little bit on Purim. It's a little bit on Purim, but even if it weren't Purim, it's relevant for our, our, um, our what are we, a, a support, group, support, support group, thank you. Yeah. Our support group for Emuna. So on the bottom right, what I want to share with you is a passage that comes from the Chassam Sofer, of Moshe Sofer of Pressburg, who I think was a great-great-grandparent of... Michal Shaket, I think. But uh, the Chassam Sofer, the Helega Chassam Sofer, the great Rav Moshe Sofer. So the Chassam Sofer wrote Tshuvas, he wrote a commentary on the Gemara, we have his parish on Chumash, we also have Drushas. We have the Drushas that he gave, whether he delivered these as Drushas or they're simply Drush, it's the style of writing. So this comes from his uh, Drushas, the Chassam Sofer, Rav Moshe Sofer's Drushas. So on the bottom right corner is where I want to begin. Vihine. First, he asks a complicated question, and I don't want to get lost on focusing on the question having to do with the Gemara in the first parak of Megillah. On Dav Zayin, that Esther, Megillah's Esther, was written in Baruch HaKodesh. Megillah's Esther was written with divine inspiration. Esther received divine inspiration when Esther was, when Esther was written. By the way, this is an amazing... I, I came across last week, both my friends, Rabbi Shalom Baum and Rabbi Karapkin, Rabbi Baum and Tinek, Rabbi Karapkin and Tinek, both shared... This uh, incredible Rav Sadya Gaon. Rav Sadya Gaon, it's not an Achron, Rav Sadya Gaon from the period of the Gaonim, talking about a thousand year, over a thousand years ago. Rav Sadya Gaon writes that Achashverosh is the one who commissioned Megillus Esther. So some say, this is a reflection of just how foolish and stupid he is. He commissioned a book that tells a story that sh- shows him in a poor light. But what does it mean, Achashverosh commissioned the book of Esther? That might have been part of the controversy that surrounded whether to include Esther in Tanakh. There was a debate whether Esther should be canonized. Um, but Rav Sajigon writes that, that it's Ahasuerus himself who, who, who commissioned the, the writing of Esther. So Rabbi Karabkin suggested, I think he gave a drasha in his shul last, last Shabbos in Toronto on this, he suggested that maybe the message for us, it's part of what we're going to talk about right now, is even when an Ahasuerus commissions a work, so you think nothing could be more mundane Nothing could be less holy or sacred than an Achashverosh commissioning this work. But if it has relevance to your life, it too can be made holy. That even within that which appears mundane, even within that which appears separate and apart from our story, when it connects to our story, it too has a message for us. And the whole experience of the Megillah is trying to reveal Hashem's hand within that which is hidden. So it doesn't just mean revealing Hashem's hand within nature. Even revealing Hashem's hand within the memoir of an Achashverosh. You can even find Hashem's hand within there. Okay, so keep that in mind as we read this. V'hinei, letaretz, in order to answer the question that I'm not telling you what it is, the Chassam Sofer tells you what it is, I'm not telling you because it's complicated, and the question is not so important for us, it's the answer. Towards the end of the Megillah, it says, the Megillah itself, that these days of Purim should not pass, will never end for the Jews. The Jews hold on to these days of Purim. V'zichram and their memory will never stop from their offspring, from their progeny. Ha'inin ki amru chazal, our rabbis, M'sech Hestana, say, Mishinichnes Adar, Mar ben Besimcha. We already know, for two weeks we've already been, been uh, different. Funny hat day, funny sock day, funny this day, funny that day. If your kids go to school, each day is another funny day. You got the music playing, the joy of, of Adar. When the month of Adar enters, we expand our sense of Simcha. It's interesting that that Gemara in Tanis that he's referencing also has the opposite. Av When the month of Av enters, we diminish our joy. When the month of Adar enters, we expand, we promote our joy. Why doesn't it just say, in Adar we feel joy, and in Av we don't feel joy? Why does it talk about Marbim and Mema'atim? We expand joy and we diminish joy. Why not just say, in Adar be happy, in Av be sad? It's much more direct, it's much more focused. So Rav Schwab explained once that joy, simcha, is an indispensable part of human condition. You can't live without joy. The question is not be joyous in this month and be sad in the other. The question is how happy are you? 
One month we focus on external, at least external manifestations of happiness. And the other we say, it's sad, it's inappropriate. If one loses a loved one and they're sitting shiva, even though you need a joy for life always, a simcha sachayim, but we would say there's something awkward, there's something wrong. If the person's sitting shiva, is laughing, telling ja, you know, if there's too much of us not celebrating the life of the deceased, but, but as besimcha, like they're, they're not saddened. You know, the Rambam writes, it's cruel. To not be sad by loss is cruel. To not be moved by a sense of loss is cruel. So you can't live without simcha sachayim. You have to have a sense of simcha in life. You have to have a joy for life, a zest for life, a happiness in life. Schwab wrote that, that simcha is like a pilot light. You know what a pilot light is? Yes. Okay. Everyone with their... Yeah. Now we have... Uh, we have electric cooktops. The electric cooktops and the uh, whatever. But those of you who remember what a pilot light is, the pilot light, the pilot light is lit. Your hot water heater, right. The pilot light is lit 24-7. And the only question is, do you turn on the flame to cook? Or are you done cooking and you lower the flame? But you leave it as a pilot light. Simcha in our lives is a pilot light. And the only question is, is it appropriate right now to fan the flame, to turn up the flame? Or is it inappropriate that right now calls for lowering the flame? This is an inappropriate moment. So mar b'simcha or mamatin b'simcha, but you always have to have simcha. You always have to have simcha. When a person, you see that Somebody suffering from depression who has no joy for life, who can't find joy, who can't find the ability to smile, who doesn't believe they deserve to live, who doesn't think the world needs them, described as, as darkness. They're living under a cloud of darkness. Such a person is despondent. They've lost the joy for life. They don't even think they're capable ever of feeling joy again. That's mental illness. Health, mental health, is when you always maintain a joy for life. Does that mean that you have no problems? You have problems. You have to confront the problems. You've got to deal with the problems. You've got to strategize the problems. But underlying all the problems is trying to find that which to be happy about. You woke up this morning. There's someone in your life. There's a roof over your head. If it weren't a fast day, the, the coffee. <laughs> to savor a cup of coffee in the morning is a reason to be besimcha. A good cup of coffee to start your day, just the coffee itself. The discovery of the coffee bean. The flavor, the aroma, the taste. I'm trying to compensate here. Compensate. The caffeine kick. So, a, a cup of coffee could give you simcha. Open your eyes. You looked outside. Oh, there's a sun in the sky. Oh, it's not overly humid. Okay, the, the littlest things. If you're predisposed, if you're predisposed to want to find simcha, from the second you open one eye, you'll find something to be the simcha about. If you're predisposed to always why everything is wrong and why it's not going to work out and why the sky is caving in and why, then, then you'll, wait, open, you'll open half an eye and the whole world is wrong. You don't even want to get out of bed. So even before you open your first eye, the attitude that you bring, the default of your life, are you besimcha or are you besadness? Which way do you lead your life? Simcha sachayim. There has to be that. If, if the pilot light goes out, that's mental illness. That's, that's despondency. That's depression. That's... And that's a legitimate illness. It needs to be treated. I, not, I don't mean to, God forbid, in our generation, we have to be especially sensitive to realize that mental illness is illness. It deserves as much attention, love, support as physical illness. My point is, though, that if we want to stay mentally stable and healthy, then we have to maintain our pilot light and sometimes raise the flame, hopefully often raise the flame, and at times lower the flame. So the Mishnah Tana says, the Mishnah Ad Av, it's interesting, he uses the word kishem. Just like in Av, you lower, just like, what do you mean just like? What's the connection between the two? So I saw a parish. When it comes to Av, we all have no problem with the, with the sadness. Jews, were good at sadness. That, that, comes, that comes naturally. So when it comes to, you know, don't wear clean clothing, don't shower, no meat, no music, no shaving, no haircut, no this, no this, no this, no this, no this, done. The kishem is the same way with which we have no problem pursuing and living the charge for sadness, we should live the charge for happiness. Happiness is a little harder. Because well, sadness, we say, okay, so I'll do all those things, I'll be sad. Happiness is an emotion, why should I feel happy? The answer is the same way that we can engage in behavior and activity which cultivates a sense of sadness. We can engage in behavior and the type of thinking that cultivates a sense of happiness. In any case, Perish Rashi, 
So what do you mean Mishnech Nesav Mar B'Mesimcha? So Rashi there says, Yimei Nisim Hayul Yisrael Purim U'Pesach. Why should you be happy in Adar? Why should you be happy in Adar than in Kislev or Teves or Shvat or, or Tishrei or Elo? Why are you happy in Adar? So Rashi there on the Gemara says, why? Because these are days of miracles. What miracles? Purim and Pesach. Hainu Smichas Geula Geula Adar V'Nisan. The fact that we have back-to-back miracles, back-to-back months of salvation, is cause for happiness. As you go through your troubles of today, you say, you know what? Once upon a time, we also had troubles. And look how back-to-back, month after month, miracles happened. Unexpected miracles, the way things worked out. So, so too, something's going to work out. Mm-hmm. So the Chassam Sofi here says, there's an enormous difference between Adar and Nisan between Purim and Pesach. Enormous difference. Why is Nisan called Nisan? Because it is the month of Nisan. It is the month of miracles. Ten plagues and splitting of the sea. And Nisan is the month of the greatest revelation where Hashem intervened and interfered with the natural order more than ever. As the rabbis say, as the rabbis explained that these nisim were not in the natural way. By a pirsum yoser, lefisha, mikom makom, eno mafursem as hashkachas tmidios, a kol psia upsia, shlo yigra mitzadik eno. The a kol advarm shem bechoz agad, a chutz lateva, nisha le ma'ara lahara, kasher hiru, a mashar ben alava shalom. So the month of, of Nisan, the miracles of Nisan, are all supernatural miracles. They're all miracles that interfered with nature, that suspended nature. They're all miracles outside the natural order. The fact that the ten plagues, each of those plagues, the splitting of the sea, it's unnatural for a sea to split. The fact that we began to wander in the desert where we were protected by divine clouds. The fact that every one of these miracles revolving around the story of Pesach and the month of Nisan are miracles above nature. However, Adar, the miracles of Adar, The miracles of Adar are miracles where absolutely nothing was outside its normal or natural element. Everything went on as normal. Chesherish married to Vashti, they had a fight, he got rid of Vashti, he had a beauty contest, he got a new queen. I mean, you read the entire story, you review the entire story of Purim, and you say, that's it? Where is the miracle? Where is the supernatural thing? Even more, you say, where is Hashem? Where is Hashem's name? Where is Hashem's name? It doesn't appear anywhere in the Megillah. People like to quote, it's the only book of Tanakh which Hashem's name doesn't appear, which is not true. What other book does Hashem's name not appear? Anyone know? Shir Hashirim. Shir Hashirim, Hashem's name does not appear. There's some message there, not for now. But in the Megillah of Esther, in Megillah's Esther, whomever commissioned Megillah's Esther, Hashem's name does not appear. And if you want, you could read the entire story as being just a natural string of coincidences, a random flow of events that yielded an outcome that happened to be favorable to us, but there's nothing, there's nothing supernatural. It's an incredible quote. Says the Chassam Sofer, when one contemplates the story of Purim, from the beginning of Achashverosh's great feast until the end of the Megillah, you'll recognize that Hashem had amazing providence in the manner in which He leads the world. And Hashem continues to do that with us today. What's the problem, however? Ein bal hanes makir biniso. That's his language. Ein bal hanes makir biniso. What does that mean? The person who's experiencing the miracle doesn't see the miracle while it's happening. While you're experiencing a miracle, you have no perspective. You have no context. You have no scope. So while you're in the miracle, you don't even see the miracle. Ein bal hanes makir biniso. nemar. This is the month of Adar. So which is the month that you have Simcha? Not Nisan. Where do you have Simcha, the obligation of Simcha? Adar. 
Which is greater? The miracle that transcends nature, that interferes with nature, or the miracle that is subsumed within nature? Which is the greater miracle? It's the miracle within nature. Hashem, Hashem controls the entire world. Should Hashem want, He can manipulate all of nature. He can manipulate the entire world. He can interfere. He can manipulate. He can have all of nature do exactly what He wants. But He doesn't want to do that. He created a world and a natural world. And He created a world of our free will. And the more He interferes with the world, the more He interferes with free will, which offsets the equilibrium of the purpose of existence. He wants to be in the shadows. He wants to be where we have to look for Him. Because that's what makes the relationship meaningful. When he's not obviously clear, when he's not explicitly exposed to us, and we have to go look for him, that's what develops the relationship. So he wants to be hidden. However, when he forms us as a nation, we'll talk about this Pesach time, for whatever reason there, the pomp and circumstance, the Ramban, the end of Parsha's bow, the Ramban elaborates the entire reason for miracles and why God took us out of Egypt with such miracles. But the month of Adar is that Hashem, even when we fail to see it, even when we struggle to recognize it, even when it doesn't feel like it, Hashem is also the one pulling the strings. That, that is the greater appreciation and acknowledgement of a miracle. Ein bala neis makir biniso. Says the Chassam Sofer, the reason we're celebrating Purim, what we're supposed to achieve out of Purim, is to realize that the same way that when you read the Megillah, it looks like a random string of coincidences, but we know that Hashem was orchestrating and choreographing everything, so too in our lives, even though things can feel like a random string of coincidences, there is a person pulling the strings. There is someone choreographing and orchestrating everything that happens. And it's all for a reason. It's not random. It's not chance. The philosophy and the attitude that it's random and chance, whose philosophy is that? Amalek. That's exactly what we're battling on Purim. That's exactly the philosophy of Amalek. That's exactly what we read this past Shabbos. And we declared our commitment, we affirmed our pledge that we will remember and never forget. What did Amalek want to do? Asher karcha baderach. Rashi gives multiple interpretations of what asher karcha means. One is milashon kor, cold. We just came from Harsinai, Parshas Yisro. We were on fire. We heard in a great shir and amuna. We just heard yamima mizrahi. We just, whatever it makes us go on fire. We were on fire. We're on fire. Best Davani, best Tehillim, best Midos, best mother, best wife, best father, best father. We were on fire. And Amalek snuck up behind us because they came, they came behind us. And Asher Karcha, they splashed cold water on our fire. You know that friend who you're so excited about something and they come and they splash cold water on your fire? And they say, what are you so excited about that? Don't you know about them that this, that, and the other? Really? You're so excited about that? Didn't you hear that? The, 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 you know? That's not so great. I heard much greater. And you're like, eh. I was just, like, what happened? I was just on fire. I was just so excited. I was just so enthusiastic. I was just so passionate. And that mida, that mida of coming and splashing cold water, it's the mida, Amalek is the mida of eh. The mida of eh. I've written in the past that Rav Hutner describes. The philosophy of Amalek is, it's a, it's a philosophy of Nothing is sacred, nothing is holy, nothing is worthy of awe. Amalek is all the philosophy of eh. 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 Nothing impresses Amalek. Nothing is impressive. Nothing is worthy of awe. Nothing comes from above. Nothing is greater than ourselves. Nothing is worthy of admiration. What, what uh, Rav Hutner calls it, koach ha-chilu. Chilu is to be mechalel. Chol. Lahavda ben kodesh lachol. Koach ha-chilu is to take sacred things and make them profane. This isn't a shul. There's nothing holy about this room, the shul. Look, I can do X, Y, and Z in this room. Right. You know? You think that rabbi is so great, they're so holy? Ah, eh, I googled them, and do you know that they, blah, 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 no, they're nothing special. The koach hachilul is, you think the sunset is so magnificent? Ah, eh, it's the uh, picture, you know, uh, somebody doctored the picture that makes it. The koach hachilul is to take anything with cynicism and sarcasm and attitude, the Koach HaChilo is to say, splashing cold water on it. You're so excited about that new song, that new recipe, that new teacher, that new Rebbe, that new Machanech, that new book that you got, the new, whatever you're excited about, you're so excited about, I can come and splash water on your fire. That's Koach HaChilo. That's Amalek, Asher Korcha, Milosh and Kor. We, the Jewish people, we have that pilot light, that the flame, we turn up the flame. 
We're an Eish Kodesh. We're an Eish Tamid. We're an Eish Tamid. We have a flame that never burns out. The flame that never burns out. Rabbi Zavin Miller spoke a couple weekends ago. He gave a magnificent cheer. I never knew how much physics he knew. He talked about the second law of thermodynamics called entropy, which is that matter dissipates, decays, order turns to disorder and chaos. That's one of the rules of physics, one of the rules of nature. And, um, and he talked about the fact that the significance of the symbol, that when Moshe walked by a burning bush which was on fire but wasn't consumed, and then in the Mishkan, the Ner Ma'aravi of the menorah was always lit and it never went out. And then in the Beis HaMikdash, and then Hanukkah, we had oil, it shouldn't have lasted, it defied the rules of physics, and it kept burning, and it didn't go out. And he quoted all throughout Jewish history that image of the fire of the flame, which is burning and doesn't go out. And he said, his theory, his thesis was, that was chosen as the symbol because that's the Jewish people. Empires have risen and fallen. Leaders have ascended the throne and disappeared. Cultures have dominated the world and disappeared into dust. And here we are, the Jewish people. I forgot who, what great historian he quoted, wrote three Mark volumes. Twain. It wasn't Mark Twain. He wrote a great historian who wrote three volumes. Antiquity, and then... Uh, I don't even remember what the three eras were. And he said, the only people that were in all three volumes were the Jews. Wow. Were the Jews. And there was an asterisk he wrote in this historian about the Jews in all three volumes. Um... I forget the language that he used to describe them. But essentially that we're a fire that never burn out. Even when the fuel is empty. Even when there's no more oil. It's a... It's a... a sne and nenu ukal. It's the fact that we are on fire. So how, how do we do that? So his theory was Shabbos. Shabbos is renewable energy. That when you disconnect to reconnect on Shabbos and you get renewable energy, you never run out of fuel. The rest of the world is running out of fuel because they never stop, they never pause, they never disconnect. We disconnect to connect... The Jewish people, Shabbos is the source of our renewable energy, and it's what enables us, like the Energizer Bunny, to just keep going. So what is the symbol of Klal Yisrael? Is the Eish Tamid, is the Eish Kodesh, is this Ner Ma'aravi, is that flame which is on fire and never goes out. Amalek came and it tried to pour cold water on our fire. So the notion of remembering Amalek, Zachor, to remember Amalek and Atishkach, don't ever forget. Of course, Haman is a descendant of Amalek, Haman, we know, is a direct descendant of, for those learning Nach Yomi, right now in the book of Shmuel, and we did the story of how Shaul was instructed to destroy all of Amalek. In Shaul's pity, he spared the king of Amalek named Agag. He spared the king. Agag, when he was captured, but before Shmuel came in and killed him, Agag had a conjugal visit, and it was through the result of that intimacy that ultimately... Uh, Haman is born. Amalek, Haman is born. So the consequence of Shaul's misplaced compassion, like the Gemara says, if you have compassion to the cruel, you'll end up being cruel to those to whom you should be compassionate. His misplaced compassion ultimately leads to, leads to Haman. Haman, the birth of Haman. Shmuel says so, in, in the Haftar, Shmuel says, your mothers will be childless. Right. Why? Haman was... Because, exactly, Correct. Although Bnei Banav Shal Haman lamdu Torah b'Bnei Brak, Haman's own offspring ended up converting to the Jewish people. Gemara says and learned Torah in in Bnei Brak. Somebody just showed me uh, an article about one of the grandchildren of one of the founders of the terrorist it was Hamas, Hezbollah, one of the terrorist organizations bent on Israel's destruction, who converted. And it's a picture of him sitting in a yeshiva with a black hat, learning Bnei Banav Shal Haman lamdu Torah b'Bnei Brak. You know, this prediction that you, that you never know. So the first thing about Amalek is that, and, and this holiday of Purim is about destroying Amalek, remembering and destroying. How do you remember and destroy? Who is Amalek? Is it a biological, uh, is it a genealogical or biological nation? The answer is there's a voice of Amalek within ourselves. That voice of Amalek within us, that sarcastic voice, the koach hachilol, the eh, eh, you know, there's people who like, no matter who the speaker was, they were amazing. That was outstanding. I took so much from it. That was fantastic. <laughs> and then there's the people who every speaker we bring in, it's the koach of Amalek. Eh, I could have said it better. They said nothing. I didn't learn anything. Eh, eh, everything. Eh. 
So there's an Amalek, there's that voice of Amalek within us, of the Asher Karcha, that wants to pour cold water on other people's fires, or on the fire in us. The one piece of us, the flame, the pile of light inside of us starts to glow, and we get scared what that means. Uh-oh, am I getting more religious? Am I about to make some changes? What are other people going to think of me? How will I fit in socially? What does this mean for the things that I enjoy? So you know what we do? We pour water on our own fire. Before the flame gets too big, we extinguish it because we're afraid of what it might mean. That's a malik. That's the voice of a malik, the influence of a malik in us. What it means to be a Yid, what it means to be a Jew. Mordechai Yehudi. Ish Yehudi Abira. Is to keep that fire alive, to fan the flame, to expand the fire, to live a life to be on fire. But the other... Interpretation of Rashi of Amalek, Asher Karcha, is Milashon Mikra. Mikra means happenstance, chance. You know what else Amalek tells you? You come to Amalek and you say, you got to hear this crazy story. Things worked out so perfectly. They shouldn't have worked out. This incredible thing worked out. And I was able to get the parking spot, and I had the elevator, the job, the thing. It's unbelievable how this thing worked out. It should never have worked out. It worked out. Unbelievable. And you know what Amalek says? What are you talking about it worked out? It's a coincidence. It's a coincidence. It's just random. I randomly it worked out for you now, and yesterday it didn't work out, and randomly tomorrow it will or it won't. It's just randomness. It's just chance. It's just happenstance. It's just coincidence. It's mikra. That's the language of Amalek, Asher Karcha. It's mikra. The entire story of, of Purim and the entire experience of Adar, says the Chassam Sofer, is to battle Amalek and to read the Megillah and say, this is not a string of coincidences. This is not randomness. This was all by design. This was all orchestrated. This is all part of a plan that Kirsch Baruch Hu is unfolding. Now, we wish, we wish that we were let in on the plan. Right? If we had the crystal ball, say, Hashem, I'm happy to endure all of this right now. Just show me how in a week or in a month or in 10 years, or even if after my lifetime for my great-grandchildren, show me how why am I enduring this right now makes sense. Can I just fast forward to the end of the video? If you let me do that, we'll rewind, we'll go back. I'm happy to endure whatever it is I have to endure. We're not the first who say that. You know who was who said that before us? It's this week's parsha. Who said it before us? Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu. Hareini nas kodecha. Moshe Rabbeinu says, Hashem, show me your face. I want to see. And the first one explained, what does it mean, Hareini nas kodecha, show me your face? Your face means, I want to be able to live like you do I want to see it prospectively. I want to see it before it happens. I want to understand it as it unfolds. And what's Hashem's response to Moshe? No. Nobody can see my face and live. What's the only thing you can see? My back. The back of my head. What's the image of the back of my head? You can only understand things in retrospect. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Maybe you'll be lucky enough to put the pieces together to understand in retrospect why that worked out. Maybe. 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 But to understand prospectively in real time, that Hashem says is what makes me God. That's what makes me infinite, omnipotent. If you could understand that you'd be God, and there's not room for both of us. There's only one God. And therefore human beings are unca- incapable of understanding that. Which means that part of the leap of faith, part of the exercise of Amunah, is not just that there's a Hashem, but is the belief that there's a God, and that therefore... There are things I cannot understand. We live in a generation that wants to have it both ways. They say, I want to believe there's, oh yeah, there's a God, Amunah, Baruch Hashem, Mirz Hashem, Bezr Hashem, I go to the Amunah Shir, Hashem, 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 Enon, Mavado. But I don't understand why Hashem did this and I can't understand and I want to understand. I deserve to understand. I'm entitled to understand. And they fail to connect the dots. That part of the belief with Hashem included, it goes along with the subscription. If you subscribe to the fact that there's an omnipotent creator who created the world and is involved in our lives, it also means that we are not he. We are not him. We can't see the world the way he does. We lack the perspective. We cannot understand. We can't understand. Someone once came to the Chazanish and said that they had gone through a horrible thing in life, a terrible tragedy. Where is God? I don't understand his ways. And I, he, they were just absolutely paralyzed by trying to understand Hashem's ways. So the Chazanish opened the Gemara and pointed to a Tosos and said, could you explain this Tosos to me? So the guy tried to read the Tosos and the Chazanish said, you got it wrong. So he tried a different Pshah, Chazanish said, you don't know what you're talking about. And after multiple attempts, the Chazanish turned to him and he said, tell me something, my friend. You don't understand Tosos. 
You think you can understand God's ways? You don't understand Tosos. You think you can understand God's ways? I was thinking about this because uh, our oldest daughter is home now for Purim. She just had a big chemistry test final this week. And she just started college. And Baruch Hashem, she's very bright, very gifted. She never really had to work for anything. And she had to kill herself to get ready for this test. And Yechavid and I spent the last uh, week uh, comforting her, supporting her. Don't worry, you're going to do fine. It's like the hardest teacher in the school and nobody passes and everything else. And I was just thinking to myself, and if or when she wakes up, I will tell this to her directly, that when she wakes up, I will tell her directly that that, that story from the Chazanish, take chemistry, right? This one unit of chemistry, which was so hard to understand, at least the way that it was presented. If we can't understand that, that's just one part of a whole world. It's physics and biology. There's, there's nuclear physics. There's, the whole world is filled with intricacies. So we can't even understand, you know, how do I fix the toner or cartridge in the printer? <laughs> show me again how to connect to the Wi-Fi when I'm whatever. You know, show me again. Like, we can't figure that out. We can't. We can't even figure that out, right? Yeah. Show me again how to make the setting to be the battery. Ba- show me again to turn off the notification. I can't even figure that out, yeah. but I expect to be able to figure out how Hashem runs His world. So it's very humbling. And if we concentrate not on what a big uh, know-it-all we are, don't concentrate on what we're capable of, but if we concentrate and we admit and we concede what we're incapable of, then we'll realize wow, I'm so pathetic, I can't figure that out. What makes me think I'm entitled or capable of understanding or figuring out Hashem's world? So Moshe Rabbeinu, who was the greatest and the brightest and the humblest, said to Hashem, I want to understand, I want to see it from your face, prospectively. Hashem says, no, you can only see the back of my head. You can only understand it after the fact. And says the Chassam Sofer, that's what Purim is all about. All the other holidays, I mean, you think about it. Pesach is about the miracles of leaving Egypt. Sukkot is about the miracles of being protected from the elements while being in a hut. Shavuos is about the miracle of revelation and Hashem talking, giving us the Torah. Hanukkah is about the miracle of a flask of oil that should supernaturally, that, that naturally should have been one day supernaturally lasted for eight. Every other holiday is about supernatural. Purim is the holiday of the natural. Nothing unnatural, nothing supernatural, nothing exceptional about it. And it's our responsibility, Megillah Esther, to be Megala the Nister, to see Hashem's hand. A life of Amuna is not just when the miracle happens in front of you. A life of Amuna is not when the, that which never should have happened happened to happen and it's so easy to see Hashem's hand. A life of Amuna, the greatest of Amuna, is to have Amuna even when, when everything seems natural and it's hard to find Hashem's hand. And I'll end with this incredible teaching I saw this year. The Gemara says in Megillah, Hakore le mafreya lo yatsa. The classic understanding, the simple translation of Hakore le mafreya lo yatsa is that if you read it out of order, you're not yotze. So tonight, when you hear the Megillah, if you read the 10th parak, then the 9th parak, then the 8th parak, you're not yotze. To fulfill the mitzvah, you've got to start from the beginning, and you've got to go through to the end. Hakore le mafreya. However, the Maggid of Mezrich and many others, it's brought down, explain, Hakore le mafreya lo yatsa. The mafreya can mean backwards, but it could mean, also mean a long time ago. Hakori le mafreya. If you read the Megillah and you think that these kinds of miracles only happened a long time ago, lo yatza. You haven't fulfilled Purim. When you listen to the story of the Megillah, you should read your own story in it and recognize that even what feels like randomness in your life, even what is just purely natural, not supernatural in your life, is also all from Hashem. Hakori le mafreya. If you read this story like it's ancient, and like it, it's from a long time ago, lo yatze, you're not yotze. The Mincha Saluza, the Munkach Rebbe had a different shot. He said the word mafreya comes from the word poreya, which means to pay a debt. Hakor le mafreya, if the only reason you're reading the Megillah is to pay the debt, the obligation to read the Megillah, lo yatze. This is not about like just shake the lulav. This is, yeah, Megillah's Esther is Megala the Nister. There's a, you have to work on Purim to, you know, take away the inhibitions. That's where the Lachayim comes in. <laughs> All of, the, all of the practices of Purim are around this idea. Why is it that we dress up? Because what we're saying is, the same way that we're in costume, I'm not who I appear, you're not who you appear, so really the whole year the world is not what it appears. The whole world is a costume. 
Hashem really understands everything and I don't. What's Adel Yada? I'm conceding that just like when I'm inebriated, I'm intoxicated, I can't comprehend, I can't function, so too even when I'm sober, I have no comprehension. I really don't understand what Hashem is doing. Hashem is the one who's pulling the strings. Hashem is the one who is, who's driving the world. It's what all of the practices of Purim all surround this notion of conceding that I don't hold the keys to my destiny, I don't understand the world, but really, really Hashem is the one who's, who's in charge. So if I'm just reading the Megillah to pay a debt, to fulfill an obligation, and I'm not reading it because I, I want to feel Hashem's presence in my life, lo yatsa. But the last interpretation, I would offer everyone drinks, but yeah. it is a fasting. The last interpretation, you all right? You're okay. The last interpretation, Akor Lamafreya, is Rav Melech Biederman. Rav Eli Melech Biederman, he's got a fantastic interpretation. He says, Hakor Lamafreya, if you're only willing to be Kore, you're only willing to call out and see Hashem, Lamafreya, in retrospect, only when it's over and you see how everything worked out, how it all came together, how it all made sense, that's when you call out to Hashem, Lo Yatza. You have to also be willing to be Kore, you have to call out to Hashem, Mikan Lahaba. When you're still in the incident and you don't know how it's going to turn out and it's not predictable and you haven't made sense of it yet, then you also have to be Korei. If you're only Korei Lemafreya, if you only call out to Hashem after the fact, when you see it all making sense, Lo Yatza. To live with Amun is not just to acknowledge Hashem retrospectively, it's to live with Hashem prospectively. It's to live with Hashem even in the difficult moments to see Hashem in our lives nonetheless. So wishing everyone a very friendly and Purim. Very happy Purim, a Purim where we're successful in the Megala, the Nister, to reveal that which is hidden, mm-hmm. to see Hashem even within the natural, to see Hashem within our lives, and that we combat the Amalek within us, the Amalek who tries to convince us, eh, or the Amalek who convinces us it's just randomness, that we answer by saying, not Kodesh, ha, not Koach HaChilul, but Koach HaHilul. We are going to praise and acknowledge, we're going to thank we're going to be on fire. No one's going to pour water. Our flame is burning so bright, no fire department can put it out. We're going to be on fire this Purim by seeing Hashem in our lives.